Hey folks, David Stewart here. It's time to talk a little bit more about music theory. Today we're going to talk about notation. That is all the things that go into writing down the music. And uh, if you're an advanced student and you've already been reading music for a really long time, there are still some important concepts that I want to talk about in this lecture that I think you should know about. If you um, are not used to reading music or you only read, say, tablature, um, I will provide a supplementary, a supplementary video that will go over some of the really specific things when it comes to reading our Western notation system. And indeed, I'm going to focus on the notation system of the West, uh, that is Europe, uh, because that's the, that's the tradition that I'm an expert in. And it's also the tradition that <clears throat> produces most of the modern music notation that we use, even in other cultures. We tend to use a Western system to express um, what we're trying to do musically. Um, so if we go back to that word notation, to notate means to write down. Um, just like how when you're in class and somebody's giving a lecture, you're taking notes, you're notating what that person's speaking. You're creating a representation of their words um, if you're writing in a phonetic language. And if you're writing in something like Chinese, um, the characters represent not just the words, not just the sound of the words, but the concepts that are attached to them. So when you notate speech or you notate anything that somebody's doing verbally, you're notating the ideas and you're notating the sound of the words. In music, the goal of notation is to write down and codify those elements of music which are necessary to reproduce a performance of music. Prior to the age of recorded music in uh, the 20th century, um, music notation was incredibly important for the transmission of music. Uh, we didn't have a record that we could just give to someone to let them hear what music sounded like. We had to take the sheet music, we had to give it to somebody who was a competent musician, who knew how to read that music, and then from that notation they would then generate uh, the appropriate music. And each performer could generate it a little bit different way, kind of like reading a play. A play is a notation of how a visual play is supposed to be presented. Um, that's a really, really good way of thinking about it. Um, so sometimes in, in the modern times we get a little bit spoiled, People back in the day had to really learn how to read music well to understand what a piece of music really sounded like. Um, whenever we're notating music, there's two elements that we need to be able to notate. One is pitch and the other is rhythm. Uh, those are the two fundamental elements of music that we, uh, that we use to express ourselves. Uh, remember, if you go back to that very first video, very first little, um, little tidbit lecture that I gave, um, I said that music is our response, what we, what we perceive of music is um, the relationship between pitches over time. So the pitch or is the frequency part. You know, we can write that down as like hertz, right? You know, the frequency. The rhythm is the division of, of time passing by. Uh, and I have that lecture that talks about dividing the, the, the passage of time into regular intervals uh, to create a beat. That's all goes into rhythm. So an ideal notation system tells you what note to play, what pitch to play, that is, and uh, what the rhythm of that will be. And in the West, we developed a pretty good system that helps us to know in more or less absolute terms what the pitch is and what the rhythm is, uh, or what the division of time will be. Um, but before we get to that, let's go back to the history of notation because notation in music is not that old. Um, we don't get accurate pitch notation um, until the Middle Ages. And um, even then, it's not necessarily accurate because we don't have a perfect reference pitch. We hadn't developed perfect reference pitches. They're relative, their pitch is relative to one another. Um, so they may sound more or less different depending on what, what frequency you decide to start a given piece on. Um, originally, before we had developed a, a system of notation, everything was learned by rote. And indeed, in most cultures, um, you learn things one person to another. There's, a, there's an oral tradition that goes there. If you were to go study music in, say, India, um, you would study with a guru, uh, somebody who really understood the music, and they would teach you directly all the things that you needed to know to interpret the raga or satiraga or whatever it is correctly. In the West, we write these things down so we can transmit the ideas much further, um, and also so people who've never met each other can play the same musical ideas. Um, but if you want to travel way back in time to, like, you know, the ninth century, back when Charlemagne was... Uh, conquering people left and right. He really wanted um, music from Rome. He really liked the Roman Catholic music, um, but people in France didn't really know how to interpret that music. And so he sent people to go learn it and maybe spread it throughout France. And what eventually you get from that is what ends up being called chant or plain chant or Gregorian chant, named after, after Pope Gregory. And uh, it's named after Pope Gregory because he's the one who sort of spread it throughout Western Europe with the Catholic Church. 
Uh, but in order for us to spread it, uh, we really had to be able to find a way to notate it, to write some of it down so that when we moved it to a different geographic location, it could be actually reconstructed. So if you go back and you look at, uh, and you can Google this, and maybe I'll edit in some images so you can see what these look like. Some early neums, um, usually spelled like that, N-E-U-M-E, -E, a neum or neums. Here are some examples of early neums. As you can see, they are not nearly as useful as you would hope that they would be. Uh, these are early notation elements, and the very earliest notation elements look very, very weird. They don't look anything like music that you'd see today, but they kind of look like are some squiggly lines um, like this, and um, that's sort of what they look like. And then underneath it, you'd have uh, uh, whatever uh, word you'd be chanting here, Kyrie, right? So you'd, um, you're like, how does this uh, work? Well, what it was is um, you would learn uh, um, you would learn a Kyrie, a given chant, from one person to another, and this just helped you remember the shape and the way it went. So it would go up, it would go down, maybe it would hold on a, on a note and go kind of up and then back down again, and then go up and hold on a note. And that's the way that you would remember the shape of the chant, the way it went up and down and how long relative you, you happen to hold each of these. There's no specific rhythm and there's no specific pitch. Um, and this was music that was also meant to be conducted. And conducting um, early music or early um, church music is not the same as conducting today. Conducting today, uh, you have a conductor who's uh, more or less a glorified metronome. And that may upset some people when I say that. But the main thing is you're, you are controlling the tempo and the rhythm, uh, really just the tempo because the rhythm is, is assigned and relative to the tempo. You're controlling the tempo and giving some expressive gestures to the orchestra as a conductor. Um, you are not, however, defining what pitches that that person will sing or play. But with this old style of conducting, if you go back to the Middle Ages, it, um, the conduction was, had to do with a, a number of signs that would tell the performers what note to sing based on a scale or a mode that they learned. Um, and if you've ever seen like a, a kid's choir, if you ever watch a, a, somebody who's a, a choral teacher teach kids how to sing um, their solfege, they usually, they might have a system like do, re, mi, you know, this thing. I don't remember it because I'm not a, not a choir teacher, but um, you may see the kids doing all these hand signals. It's kind of like that. That's sort of what we used in the Middle Ages is you'd have one, one person, you know, conducting a group of, of choristers or clerics, and um, he'd be using the hand signals to tell them sort of what note they needed to be on in here, and he'd be looking at the neumes to remind himself of which ones went where. But as we started to transmit the ideas, this became insufficient. So what we ended up drawing was, uh, we ended up drawing a line, a single line, and, and that was the line for what's called the final. I'll explain this a little bit deeper when we get to modes, but the final is kind of like the tonic. It's the last pitch, hence we call it the final, and the main pitch that the, the chant tends to rest on is called the final. And here is an example of a one-line neum. So we had this, this notation of the final, and eventually we would call that C, by the way, and that kind of helped us. So we know, okay, it starts off and it goes up, you know, it goes up above the final, and then it goes down below the final, and then it goes to the final, and then it goes up above, and then it goes down, and then finally it rests on the final. And we know that, okay, we're going to rest a little bit below the final. So we have an idea of where the final is when we look at the neumes. What we started to do after that um, with early pneumatic notation is we added another line for um, what you could think of as the dominant. And there's a couple other words for it in, um, in uh, modal terminology. One of them is primus. Um, but it's basically the dominant. So there's another dominant pitch that you go up to, and then you go back down to, you go up to it again, and you go back down to it. And eventually what you got was a four-line staff um, that is still used today to read and interpret early music and was still used as a, as a regular means of reading music by the Catholic Church all the way up until 1962 inside of what's called the Liber Usualis. If you don't know what the Liber Usualis was, it was a book of chants, um, put out by the Catholic Church, published and maintained by the Catholic Church. It would help you construct what mass um, you happen to be doing on a given day. Um, so what we ended up with was these four lines. Then we have the Kyrie down below. And um, we even started to get with this four line notation, some rhythmic notation. Because right here, we don't know how long we're holding that note for. We just know that we're kind of going to hold it. <clears throat> we're not sure how long that note's going to be held. Here we start to get um, some actual rhythmic notation. And what you get with the um, with this uh, pneumatic notation, you get a little, it looks like a C. It looks like a C. 
and uh, that tells you what node is C. Okay, so we assign C to this line, and then um, we can do the chant from there. So we may have a um, you know a couple little squares, uh, and you may have uh, two squares that look like this. They indicate mm, da da, and uh, then you may have uh, something that looks like this. They indicate that. And you may have uh, two notes that look like this. You may have a, a, a fall here to indicate you know fast notes going in between. There's a couple different systems for pneumatic notation, and I can do a video specifically on neumes uh, if you guys are interested in um, in looking at them. The best way to learn it, though, and uh, I don't know if I'll link it below, but I might, is to take a look at the Liber Usualis. You can find PDF copies of it all over the internet. I'm sure I can dig one up and link it in the description box. Um, what the Liber Usualis was, that, that book of plain chant, it's all stuff that it, it's actually still used today in the, um, in the um, Trinity Mass, if you happen to go see an old-style Mass. But after the Vatican II, um, they started doing the Mass in the vernacular and the music changed and the Liber Usualis became suppressed or, you know, just wasn't used is what, what it really is. But if you look at a good copy of it, it'll explain everything you need to know to read pneumatic notation. What notes are, happen to be C, uh, how long these, these rhythms are, and um, how long you play each one, each note for, and what, if a note has a particular look, what rhythm that represents. So all of that will be inside the Liber Usualis, and it's definitely worth checking out if you're interested in early church music. Um, but eventually we decided that this was insufficient. And one of the reasons that it was insufficient is that even though we start to get a rhythm in sort of seeing what, you know, we, we have a, a, we have a, like a square note here um, that looks like that, and we have an idea that it's a, it might be a, what we might think of today as a quarter note, we don't have a time signature. So if you go back to that lecture where I say we're grouping things in terms of beats, the constant pulse, we're grouping things in terms of measures, grouping beats together, and we're dividing the pulse further. This just is based on one pulse. And the pulse you usually use, by the way, was 60 beats a minute, your heartbeat, the clock ticking. That was the standard uh, assignment of a beat. And if you wanted it to go faster, you just divided the beat further. Eventually, we decided this wasn't totally sufficient. So we added a fifth line, and we created what is now the modern staff. And the way the modern staff works, much like the pneumatic staff, is um, we have five lines. We have a sign at the beginning of the um, at the beginning of the piece of music that tells us what notes are going to be on what lines and spaces of the staff. So if we have a note on this space, that's an A, and the way the look the note looks tells us the rhythm, tells us how long to play it for. Um, so we end up having two elements that combine together really well to notate our two essential elements for this. We have rhythm, which is going to be the way the note looks. Um, and then we have um, the pitch, which is going to tell us which note is where. So if we see, and we use the lines and the spaces on the staff, if we run out of room on the staff, we can draw some extra lines up top. Um, and uh, we can even notate pretty closely the exact pitch, now that we've standardized tuning, um, by using this clef. So this, this clef is actually called the treble clef, for those of you who don't know. And um, it's used for higher pitched instruments. Um, this note right here would be the middle C on the piano, <clears throat> and anything all the way up to the very ends of the piano, the very high notes on flute or violin and, or, or instruments like that. Flute and violin read in treble clef, as does uh, clarinet. There's transposing instruments that are bass, instruments that read on treble clef. We'll talk about those some other time. Um, and there's a bunch of different clefs. There's a treble clef, there's an alto clef, there's a bass clef, and each clef assigns a different, is relative to a different set of pitches, high or low. So the bass clef tends to represent the lower pitches, the treble clef tends to re represent the higher pitches, and the alto clef represents those pitches that are kind of in the middle of those two staves. There's also things like tenor clef. I might do a video that's just on clefs or something like that. But this is the basic stuff that you need to know. You have a pitch element and you have a rhythm element and those combine. At the beginning, you'll also have a time signature which tells us all of our rhythmic groupings. It tells us um, what note gets the beat in this case, um, or in the bottom note tells you what note gets the beat, which is the, um, uh, the beat assignment. And then the top note tells you the measure assignment. How many beats you're grouping together to create a measure. Every, so, every four beats, you put a, a nice little bar line there. And so the, the music, when you look at it, you see all the rhythmic values, you see all the division of time that's there, and 
you can see what pitches you're supposed to play. And that's essentially the important elements that you need to know about notation. I'm going to do a supplementary video that's going to go through the specifics of how you can read music on our traditional staff um, and uh, some of the clefts and some of the ways to go about memorizing those notes. Uh, but for now, for you more advanced students, I don't want to spend a bunch of extra, uh, a bunch of extra video time talking about the little stuff. I want to talk about the big concepts so that you understand where we're going. All music notation um, systems really want to try to accurately reproduce these two elements in order for music to be transmitted, written down, and then performed later. Okay, okay. I've realized I forgot something. I want to mention tablature. Tablature is a second kind of notation system that's specific to fretted instruments like the uh, lute, the guitar, and uh, in some cases the viol de gamba. Um, and what tablature does is rather than assigning pitch and rhythm, what it does is it assigns the placement of the fingers. It tells you exactly what you're supposed to technically play on the instrument rather than what pitch you're supposed to reproduce. Um, tablature, contrary to popular belief, uh, is not a modern invention and wasn't created to help guitar players hack their way through life. Um, it's a very, very old, old invention back before there was this, back before this thing existed, um, and when we just basically had, you know, sacred music being written in this. Um, and by the way, um, all this stuff, this is from the, the church uh, and wasn't really used in secular music until, you know, the Renaissance period. And then by then we start developing this staff. And this becomes uh, standard by the 17th century. This is the standard way that you read music, both in a, in a secular setting and in a lot of sacred settings and whenever you're dealing with professional musicians. Plain chant would still be constructed out of the, out of the four line staff, um, but the, um, the five line staff was used for most, for most music by the 17th century. Uh, tablature, however, has lines, uh, much like a, a staff would have lines. Um, Well, we tend to use six lines, sometimes more depending on the lute, and, and instead of having notes that look a certain way and tell you the rhythm, what you get is uh, letters if you're dealing with lute tablature, old lute tablature, which goes all the way back to like the medieval period. Um, you're going to have letters which look kind of like this, um, B, and then you might have a, a C, and then you might have a D that looks like this, sideways D. Um, that tells you what fret you're going to press on what string. With this being usually in, in most tablature, this is the first string, that would be the sixth, or first course and sixth course, because lutes are double strung. Um, with Baroque lute, you would actually have, I don't have time to get into Baroque lute tablature, but you'd have the letters um, of this in reverse, and then you'd have on top what note to play in the, on the harp strings. So it, it tells you how to technically execute what you're supposed to be doing. Modern tablature doesn't use letters. Um, this is uh, from lute tablature, French and German lute tablature, um, prior to, from the 18th century and before, um, tends to use letters. Um, modern tablature, which is based on Spanish tablature, not Italian tablature or French tablature, but Italian and Spanish both use numbers. Uh, they don't use letters. Um, so I'll just draw it up here. Two, three, four, five, six. Um, and you get numbers, one, three, two, four, and then maybe here you have a number. So you have numbers on what strings, this being the first, this being the sixth. If you're reading um, Renaissance tablature and you're reading an Italian manuscript, this is reversed. The sixth string is up top, the first string is on the bottom. Um, and maybe I'll do a video that's specifically on how to read lute tablature and things like that. But lute tablature predates this in, in most cases. It predates the five line staff. It's a more archaic, it's an older form of notating that only works for lute players. Why is uh, the staff usually going to be a little bit superior for notating what you want? Well, this doesn't tell you anything theoretically about the music. It just tells you where your fingers go. This will be able to, as we go along, exhibit lots of important theory information and will tell you the pitch. So any instrumentalist that reads staff notation you could pick up your music if you've written in staff notation. You could hand it to a piano player. You can play the music and reproduce the pitches and the rhythm uh, accurately. The other problem with tablature is it's very difficult to, to notate rhythm. A lot of modern tablature will have like some eighth notes that look like that, um, but it tends to be kind of difficult and it doesn't show the shape of the music. It only shows where the fingers go. So the, the five line staff is a superior system for theory and indeed for most 
most things. However, if you're interested in historical music, uh, tablature uh, is definitely helpful because it also transmits through time the technical aspects of how people played lute back in the 17th century and prior, um, rather than just what pitches um, a composer happened to want to write down. In this case, that composer is telling you exactly how to play it. So thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what you want to see and what you want to hear down below. And I hope this series has been informative and fun for you. I certainly have fun making these videos. You guys have a great, great day.